It's often exciting to look to the future of UNO, what it might be like in times to come. Sometimes, though, it's important to stop. Stop and take a good look at the past of the university, the people and the happenings that help make the excitement of future history possible. With this in mind, join me for Reflections in Time. It's the summer of 1984, and we're on North 49th Street at a home I visited many years ago, and I'm so happy to come back to it. We're doing what is known as Reflections in Time, where we ask former faculty members, staff, people, some too are still on our campus who worked with programs and people for a long time, about their reflections about the University of Omaha and the University of Nebraska at Omaha. And I came to a real expert on the subject today, to Harry Rice, who spent 27 of his years as a teacher with our University of Nebraska at Omaha for one year, but most of his time was spent with the original University of Omaha. Harry, as a friend and as a former colleague, it's just great to be back with you in your home. Well, I'm very happy to have you here. Harry, the purpose for our getting together is to make a couple of very informal tapes that will be housed in the alumni house at our university and in the library. So as the years roll along and someone wants to check up on the period in history that you reflect, they can turn to reflections in time and hear what Harry has to say. And now we're going to start with that, but before we talk about the university, I want to spend a number of minutes. You've got an interesting past, and I want to know where Harry Rice started from, and your early beginnings, well, and what brought you finally to Omaha, way back there. I graduated from the very small high school in Blue Springs, Nebraska. <laughs> there were Where is Blue Springs? It's uh, eight miles south and four miles east of Beatrice. Uh -huh. I think most people know where Beatrice is. Surely. And uh, uh, Highway 77 goes past the west edge mm -hmm. and on down past the west edge of Wymore, which is adjacent yes. to Blue Springs. Yes. And... Uh, my father was a general merchandise merchant there for over 60 years. Is that right? And, uh, of course, I started working in the store after school on Saturdays when I was old enough to count eggs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all seven of us children, I was the youngest of the seven children, graduated from Blue Springs High School. Yes, now this wasn't a big school, as I recall, from our visiting before. Kind of small, wasn't it? Yes, we had uh, five boys and three girls in the, my graduating class. But now don't be modest. Remember, Which you graduated with honors. Yes, yeah. <laughs> valedictorian. That's and, great. Uh, <laughs> although it was a small school, we were fortunate in having excellent teachers, especially in uh, English and Latin, which was taught by the woman principal of the high school, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, German was taught by a young woman from Sutton, Nebraska, and she was an excellent teacher, and we had excellent teachers in both mathematics and physics, which were my primary interests. Say, maybe that sort of started you on the road to your career, a good I teacher in math, it. huh? I wouldn't doubt it. And, uh, about the only hobbies I had because of the small size of the school and the fact that we just had that one old building with no gym with baseball. I played five years on the high school baseball team. and uh, They didn't have basketball because they didn't have a gym, huh? Didn't have a gym. Uh -huh. And band. I started playing in the high school band and the small town band when I was eight years old. What, kind, what instrument did trumpet. you play? Oh, great. I did you play the cornet. Yeah. So we have something in common here. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, um, I continued playing the trumpet until I uh, graduated from the University of Iowa in 1926, 28. So music was sort of a through-school hobby for oh, you. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, 
I think that's one of the reasons that I uh, found my bride to be because she you heard you she playing the trumpet. Both, well, we both <laughs> played the college orchestra. Oh, is that at right? uh, Lemar's Iowa? And uh, then after I graduated from high school, I worked for two years full time in my father's general merchandise store. What kind of work did you do, Harry? Oh, everything. I drove his Model T truck, <laughs> delivering groceries and hauling freight. Didn't have to have a driver's license then either. Didn't have to have a driver's license then at all. And I started driving his Model T when I was 14 years old. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was good experience. So uh, I worked from 6.30 in the morning till 6.30 in the evening, six days a week. That was a $20 long $20 a week. week. Oh. <laughs> well, you learned... More than room at home, of course. You learned to work. And so during those two years, I saved some money and decided I'd go to college. And we had a, a young pastor who was a bachelor, and he got me interested in what was then Western Union College mm -hmm. at Lamar's Island, mm -hmm. Remember which the is name. now Westmar. Yes. And uh, I had my first three years there, but because it was a small college, they didn't have enough students to justify a major in mathematics. Oh, so you weren't able to finish what you wanted to there. No. So I had to go to the university at Iowa City for my uh, bachelor's degree and also for my master's degree. You know, let's pause there for just a moment, Harry. You mentioned that back in that small school in Blue Springs, you had a good math teacher. Yeah. And you kept it up. Uh, when did you decide you wanted to really pursue math? Uh, what made you well, turn to that? that? Do you have any idea? That was my freshman year in college. I uh, stayed in what a boys' dorm, I guess you'd call it now, but they called it Union Hall. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there were several boys from uh, small rural communities that hadn't been as fortunate in their high school mathematics as I had been. Yes. And they stayed in this union hall. Mm -hmm. And they would come around and ask me to help them, which I, which I did. And uh, I helped them quite successfully, I might say. <laughs> and so one of them even bought me a box of chocolates. Wow. As a token of pre appreciation. Some of your first experience as a teacher, really. Yeah. And then by the time I was a junior, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the faculty thought enough of my ability as a teacher of mathematics, that uh, they gave me free tuition in return for teaching a course in advanced algebra. Now that was quite a plum so for a young man who needed help and needed yeah. money, huh? And I needed the help, and I yeah. and that was a big help to me. And as I said earlier, uh, that's where I met my wife. She had her first two years at the old University of Omaha out on. What, 24th and North Pratt? North 24th and Pratt, I believe, was the general address. And right. uh, then she went to Lamar's for her junior and senior year. Now, that was a church school at that time, wasn't it, with a strong well, church attachment? Is. And it still is. It still is. What of church? Of course, at that time, it was the United Evangelical Church, yes. which is now part of the United Methodist uh -huh. Church. Uh -huh. And uh, since we sang in the church choir and... Uh, and played together in the orchestra. We got acquainted, but I couldn't make any progress for a while because she was engaged to uh, one of my high school graduate chums. Oh, <laughs> friend uh, of you. And uh, <laughs> so I couldn't make any progress until that broke up. And then I went to work in earnest. <laughs> Harry just waited and waited yeah, and then he struck. Waited for my time. <laughs> and I convinced her finally that... Uh, she should be my wife. And we got engaged in uh, her senior year, my junior year. And uh, then she stayed on there and taught in what they call the academy, mm -hmm. where students who hadn't finished high school could make up their high school credits oh, yeah. before going to college. So uh, after she graduated, she stayed there and taught uh, in the academy. I went to the university for my senior year got my bachelor's in uh, June of 1926. And then in September of that year, we got married. And I was nominally head of the mathematics department at the 
uh, University of Iowa high school and junior high school. Yes, they had a school in connection with the university, yeah. didn't they? Yeah. yeah. Training teachers. Right, right. And uh, uh, Charlotte had uh, a job as secretary to the principal of the junior high school. And uh, that was a real heavy year because I was responsible for four classes five days a week at the university high school, one class at the university itself in the fall and spring semester, and I was carrying 10 hours of graduate mathematics courses. My word, you talk about a load and a half and then some. And I got the municipal, <laughs> municipal salary of $100 a month plus free tuition for my graduate courses. So at least your courses you didn't have to pay I didn't for. have to pay tuition for my courses. And then the real difficulty in the course came uh, just before Christmas because in the catalog they had a course called The Teaching of High School Mathematics listed under the department head who's Dr. H. L. Reitz. Same as my initials. Yeah, same initials. And uh, so at Christmas time, before vacation started, I went to Dr. Reitz and asked him, well, what will be my duties as your assistant in that teaching of high school mathematics course? And uh, he said, well, it means three times a week for 18 weeks. That's 54 times. He said, you had this course under Dr. Wilson last year, didn't you? And I said, yes. He said, you made an A, didn't you? I said, yes. Well, he says, give me the first ten lectures, and the rest of it's yours. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> Here I was. <laughs> and in that course, in the teaching of the high school mathematics, I had some, some students who I'd been in class with just the year before. <laughs> oh, it got a little sticky here. See, that was a little sticky, but yeah. uh, I got through it all right. And uh, I only had to flunk one student. Hope it wasn't a good friend. No. <laughs> and she went to the Dr. Reitz and complained. And uh, he had called me and asked me about it. And I, I told him, I said, well, she always came late to class. She failed all the tests I gave. What else could I do? except give her a failure. Mm -hmm. He says, that's right. So there's no problem. So now you really were getting a real taste of teaching. Oh, yeah. You, in fact, what we, more than what we'd call a full load in today's world. Like yeah, it. and in summer school, yeah. in analytic geometry, I had young fellas fresh out of high school. I had teachers, high school teachers, who were taking this course to refresh some of their mathematics. Mm -hmm. And I had two PhDs, one from business and one from philosophy, who registered for the course. And how old were you at this time? I was uh, 27. Uh-huh. One of the youngest ones in no, the group? No, 20, only 26. <laughs> I was only 26. I was married when I was 25. And, uh, but one of the satisfactions I got out of the course was at the close of the course, these two PhDs, came to me and they said, Mr. Rice, I think you've done a wonderful job teaching this heterogeneous <laughs> class of people. Well, now that gave you some confidence, And that didn't gave it? me a lot of confidence. It really did. Yeah. And you stayed at teaching from mm -hmm. then on, really, didn't you? Now, you spent some really busy years then at Iowa after you oh, finished your my. undergraduate degree. And that's one reason I decided not to continue on a Ph.D., because... Mm -hmm. Well, you can imagine uh, being in the classroom at the high school 24 hours a week, three hours a week at the university, plus 10 hours of graduate math. I was almost nervous wreck by the I time would... June came. How oh, you've lived to be 83 strong years, it's hard to imagine with all that work in those early I years. I think the reason was that I, from the time I was just a youngster, uh, I knew how to work hard. Mm -hmm. Some of that training, you head back in the store. Is that it? No, no, we have a little more time to oh. go. We've got about four more minutes on this tape area, so no hurry. Yeah. Uh, now, you've been at Iowa City, you've done graduate work, you've been working on your master's, your good wife had a job there, and you were busy. 
But then you got the call to go somewhere else, didn't you? Yes, uh, the superintendent of schools of Webb City came down looking for uh, a math teacher for the junior college. Mm -hmm. And it was a small junior college. I think they had about 65 or 70 students all told. Is that right? And uh, they offered me uh, almost twice what I was getting at the University of Iowa. So naturally, I signed up. Yes. And we went up there in, the, in August of 1927 and uh, were there for 11 years. You were there during the crash. During the... The Depression. During the Depression. Now, what did the Depression mean to you in Charlotte and the school? Did anything change, or did this, a small junior actually, college like that get along pretty well? Actually, it stayed pretty much the same. Did it? I started in at $1,800. I got $200 increments for three years in a row. Yeah. And then the Depression really hit that rural community. Yeah. And the high school principal I, and I got cut back from $2,400 a year to $1,650 a year. But you had a job. I had a job, and a lot of people didn't have a you job. You bet they didn't. And we got along. Sure. We didn't have anything for a lot of uh, trips or anything like that. In our series here, you were talking about you and Charlotte and your family's time at uh, Webster City Junior College. A small town, a small junior college in Iowa, but you had a number of years there, didn't you? Yes, I had a total of 11 years teaching uh, math through calculus, and because uh, that wasn't sufficient work to justify my salary, they also had me teach uh, introduction to psychology and courses in education, such as history <laughs> of education and, and uh, uh, methods. A, teaching. a lot of preparations. And we had a two-year course that these junior college students could take, which would qualify them to teach in rural schools. Mm -hmm. And so by teaching these courses in psychology and education and their liberal arts courses, they qualified to go out and teach in rural schools. And one summer, I uh, sold rural school supplies for the Holly School Supply Company of Des Moines. A traveling salesman? Went right out into the fields or the barns or wherever to the meetings of the rural school board. Any time I could meet with them, I'd go. And I sold rural school supplies. As a result of that experience, I changed my emphasis in teaching the <laughs> courses for the certificate to teach in high school. Uh, rural schools. I told my students, I said, now there are three things you have to be able to do to satisfy these board members. First, you have to be able to keep the fires going without burning out the grit. <laughs> Second, you have to be able to discipline the biggest boy in the class. And some of them were pretty big, weren't they? And third, you have to coach them well enough so they can pass their eighth grade examination. Yeah. I said, if you do those three things well, they'll rehire you for the next year, yeah. which turned to be turned out to be good advice. And in those days, in that state and in most states, there were so many of these small country oh, school yes. districts, weren't there? Yeah. Thousands of them. Sure. Yeah. And uh, so that uh, was pretty much my teaching at the junior college Web city. Why did you leave? Did you leave because you'd sort of gone as far as you could? Did you want to try something else? Well, I just taught. I taught for 11 years. Mm -hmm. in the last nine, I was also, in addition, the dean, the dean of the college and the registrar. So I had to keep all the records. <laughs> and I got paid an extra $200 for being dean and registrar. <laughs> for all the records for all the students. That's right. Uh, what a load of activity. You had little or no time for family, did you? Well, strangely enough, I did. Uh, we were very active in the uh, First Baptist Church there, of which we were associate members, because 
my wife and I had been sprinkled instead of being immersed uh -huh. in our so you United Evangelical Church. Quite full members. And uh, we could do everything except vote. Uh -huh. We could pay on the budget. We could teach Sunday school classes. We could sing in the choir, which we did. And uh, everything except vote. Came that was matters of voting you had to had to pass by. Yeah. All right. Then. But the reason I finally just turned in my told them I wouldn't be back after my 11th year. Yeah. I told them in March so they'd have plenty of time to get somebody else. Mm -hmm. uh, and the superintendent, who was a very good friend of mine, and his wife was an even better friend of my wife, uh, tried to talk me out of it until the 1st of July. Finally made up his mind that I meant what I said. And uh, so I freelanced in the Omaha Public Schools for a year. By freelancing, is that sort of like what we call now substitute, substitute teaching? teaching? Substitute teaching. All right. And uh, during the fall semester of 1938, I substituted just a few days each time at North, Benson, Tech, and South. Uh -huh. What brought you to Omaha? Why did you come here? Did well, you have this any was this was my wife's hometown, ah. and her parents Charlotte and her brothers familiar. lived here. I see. And uh, uh, so uh, we came to Omaha. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, that year we lived with her parents and helped share the expenses. And uh, the salary for substitute teachers at that time was five dollars a day. Five days a week, twenty-five dollars if you taught all five days. And did you do quite a bit of teaching? Well, I substituted just a few days each time in the fall semester. Mm -hmm. and then by the end of the fall semester, Bell Ryan, who was in charge of substitute teachers at that time, uh, called me up and asked me if I would uh, take a job at Franklin, eighth grade, as a permanent substitute. Ah. Still, $5 a day, $25 <laughs> a week. But I taught at Franklin School for the entire spring semester. But you made $25 every week, didn't you? Yeah. But the reason she wanted a man in there was because this particular eighth grade class had had two women teachers in the fall semester. Made nervous wrecks for both of them. You had what is known as discipline problems in that oh, class? yeah. For six weeks. I was about ready to quit. But by the end of six weeks, I prayed a little bit, <laughs> meditated a little bit, Open my Bible and says, "Go down and conquer these Philistines." <laughs> <laughs> and you did. Well, I did. How did you conquer them? Well, there's a, a young boy <laughs> uh, who's, if he'd been a girl, you'd call him beautiful, because he had a peaches and cream complexion. He had blue eyes and blonde hair. But he was the one that was get up and go sharpen his pencil any time in the midst of my explanations about English grammar or spelling or mathematics, whatever. And uh, so I had to put a stop to this. And so I got a conference with the principal of the, of the school, and I called Bell Ryan to see how far I could go, and I called, called the boy's father in. So uh, the principal and the boy's father and the boy and I had a, a little session like we're having right now. And uh, I told the father, I said, uh, now I have two boys just about the age of your son. And uh, if you will give me permission to handle your son the same way I would have my own boys in a similar situation, I think we can get along. Then he said something I would never say in the presence of my son. He said, well, you go ahead. He says, his mother and I had, can't do anything with him. Ah. Oh. So, the load was in your lap. And so I told the young boy, I said, I gave him three things. I said, first time I have to reprimand you in any way, you go down to that vacant classroom in the basement and... You stay there studying your assignments for the rest of the day. So the second time it happens, you get out of that room, you stay there for the balance of the week. 
And I said, if I have to reprimand you the third time, you go clear out of this school because Bell Ryan had told me I could transfer him to another school if I wanted to. He tried me out the first time. <laughs> and that was it. And off he went to the basement classroom. That's right. And I had no more trouble with him. And as soon as I had him under control, the rest of them Things were settled down. But the first day I went into that classroom in the spring semester, there was a very attractive young girl who was smart, too. She was the daughter of a minister here in Omaha. And when she saw a man teacher in there, she broke down and cried. <laughs> <laughs> things are really at a pretty pass now. Huh? All things are bad work. <laughs> but by the end of the semester, even the, the kids liked me. And at the Parent Teachers Association, the parents told me how glad they were that I had gotten away from this project method of teaching uh -huh. and was really teaching them some basic arithmetic, English, civics, and what else? Uh, spelling. So uh, you got a well-rounded education and work in discipline as well uh, as a variety yeah, of subjects. I, I told them, I said, now here, you folks are in the eighth grade, so you're going to high school next year. I said, you've got to learn some of these basic things before you go into high school or you'll flunk out. And speaking of high school, that's the next place you moved, right? Yeah. You went from Bell Ryan and Omaha Public Schools across the river, right? To uh, Council Bluffs. Yeah. Abraham Lincoln High School. Uh -huh. On a full-time basis. I went there. What year I, was that, Harry? In January of 1940. And what did you teach there? Just mathematics. So now you're getting into your subject here. Yeah. And I taught mathematics there for that half year and two more years. In, so those, in those years way back there, as we think of it now in 1984, as we record this program of activity, were math programs in a school and a city size of Council Bluffs pretty large, or were they very basic compared to what might be offered today? Well, they were basic math courses in algebra and geometry mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and trigonometry. And... Uh, they were, they were well taught. Uh, Gerald Kern, who later became superintendent of schools in Council Bluffs, yes. was the principal of Abraham Lincoln oh, was he? when I started teaching there. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And uh, he was a real educator. You know, he didn't stand for any monkey business. Mm -hmm. And he stressed the basics. And Abraham Lincoln had a very high rating uh, educationally, in sports, and in music under uh, uh, Rydell, you remember? Rydell. Yeah. And, uh, Good reputation. And my two boys played in the orchestra under Seidel. Si Seidel. Seidel, yeah, now he's there. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, Stanley, the younger of my two sons, uh, his especially was vocal music. Mm -hmm. And uh, he won top honors locally, district, and state as a baritone singer Is that three right? years in Is a row. Right? So you had some pleasant years at Abraham Lincoln. Had some wonderful like. years in Council Bluffs and Abraham Lincoln, yeah. two and a half years. And of course we lived there for 11 years. Mm -hmm. But now in your history and your family's history, we've come to the place for which we're representing and for whom we're making these tapes. Right. The University of Nebraska at Omaha, or rather we should say, in those days, the University of Omaha. How did you ever get tied up with us as a university? What, uh, well, what was, see, uh, my wife's parents lived here in Omaha. Yes, yes. We came over to visit them from Council Bluffs. And uh, my wife's mother had seen an ad in the World Herald that uh, they needed a math teacher for the summer session. So I oh. came to the university. Chance for a little extra money. Head of department. And Jim Earl was the head then. My uh -huh. background of experience. And uh, so they hired me for the summer session. Uh -huh. And uh, this course was the summer of 1942. and Wartime. Wartime. And uh, classes were small because we only had 450 students in day school Is that and 1,000 right? in night school. And the main administration cupola of building well, that was that almost was brand thing. new, wasn't it? That was the whole thing, yeah. except for that little white frame building 
for the building and grounds. Yes, out and back. Crew. Yeah. Yeah. That was the whole universe. Otherwise, it was 52 acres of nice grass and bushes yeah. and trees. Yeah. And uh, after I finished the summer session, they uh, they asked me whether I would like to be on the staff permanently. And they wanted to give me the same salary of $1,800 that I was getting at the high school. I said, no, I can't afford to move the same salary. I said, I'd have to have at least 2000 <laughs> so they gave me two thousand. They I met your Omaha. price. Yeah, not and even uh, two hundred a month. Yeah, and uh, we we continued to live in Council Bluffs for ten years. Now this year was nineteen forty-two. Forty-two. Right. And I started in the summer. And you kept living there then, really? I kept for living there for another ten years. Uh -huh. And then uh, my landlady, who charged me a very nominal rent decided that uh, she wasn't making any money on her investment <laughs> and she was going to sell her house. Oh. So I thought, well, if I have to buy a house, I'd better buy a house in Omaha. So we went around with various real estate agents, uh -huh. couldn't find anything in our price class that satisfied us. And uh, so we had about given up. My landlady had told me she would sell me the house $500 less than she would sell it if she had to put it on the market. Mm -hmm. And that looked quite attractive in view of the fact we couldn't find anything in Omaha. But before I got the contract signed, one of the real estate agents called me up and said, I think I've got just a house you want. And uh, so we came over and looked at it, came in that front door there, and uh, on the mantle of the fireplace, was a sign that says, Christ is the head of this house. And when I was trying to decide whether to move from Council Bluffs to Omaha, I'd meditated and prayed about it, opened my Bible, and it was a message to uh, Abraham. Mm -hmm. Take up your tent and pitch it on a hill. And this was on and a I hill? And I came over here. <laughs> it was on a hill. And the, the sign said, Christ is the head of this house. And uh, I asked the real estate agent, I have a, my adopted son who's grade school, what school will he attend? And he said, well, up here at Grant Street is just about the borderline between the various districts. But I can tell you three things. It'll be either Walnut Hill, Clifton Hill, or Rose Hill. <laughs> so I said, okay, we'll buy it. Merle, head of the math department for so many years, hired you, Harry, and you went to work for the grand salary of $2,000 a year. Right. How many hours of class did you teach for $2,000 a year? Well, at that time, the, the minimal number of hours for a full-time teacher was 15 hours. I thought you were going to say 15, yes, yeah. which is now considered an overload by a lot, you know. Yeah. But we were allowed to teach up to 18 hours by getting special permission. And uh, since $2,000 was not a very big salary, uh, uh, Everett Hosman, who was in charge of adult education at that time, yeah, he really began the adult was education, very he? good to me. And he let me teach night school up to 18 hours, total of 18 hours. And... Uh, he let me teach in both sessions of summer school, and uh, he set up seven six weeks courses at the Elf Club, in which I trained uh, prospective air cadets. Ah, now this is wartime, yeah. From government manuals, uh -huh. and uh, I was able to uh, follow some of them through their examinations at the post office. What, what sorts of things were you teaching them? Well, I had to teach them basic algebra, uh -huh. basic trigonometry, the essentials of, uh, of physics, just simple th principles of physics, current events, wow. vocabulary, and plain identification. Sort of a whole education in yeah. these various sessions. And, uh, of course, these technical manuals are a big help in such things as plain identification. I couldn't have taught 
anything about plane identification. Mm -hmm. Some of these prospective air cadets probably knew more about that than I did. Yes. But uh, together, we learned. Mm -hmm. The beautiful thing from my standpoint was, that I told them the first session, I said, don't expect me to give you any grades. I, I, I'm not going to give you any grades. I'm not permitted to. I said, all I can do is give you the very best instruction I know how to give you, and you have to be motivated to, to learn. Because whether you get into the Air Cadets or not depends on whether you pass the examination, which is not given by me, mm -hmm. but by the authorities down at the post office. So they were highly motivated, so they weren't were they? They were highly motivated. And I was able to follow through on some of those classes, and of those I followed through on, about 75% of them passed their cadet examination. Now that's very good. Which was pretty good, good I yeah, thought. Yeah. In fact, you see, they didn't pay any tuition. The Elks Club paid Everett Hosman whatever the payment was, and I got $100 for uh, uh, each of these six weeks courses, but two every nights a week from yeah. 7 to 10. That's so what I got paid. I you know. were busy day and night, yeah. weren't you, Harry? Yeah. But still, I felt like I was making a contribution to the war effort. And in those days, we needed to feel that often, yeah. didn't we? And then Everett Hosman started these courses at Offutt Field in mathematics. And I'm not sure, but I think I was the first one to go out there and teach mathematics at Offutt Field. So that is a historic beginning because yeah. we have had classes at Offutt for a long, yeah. long time. And I, I out there I taught uh, in their, what they call their, well, they're sort of like Quonset huts, but they were their education buildings. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember one night we went out there and <laughs> in the winter and there was no heat in the room. And so we all kept our overcoats and our galoshes and, and hats on. <laughs> and dismissed uh, halfway through the three-hour session because it was just too cool. Now, as you came to the university there in the early 40s during the war, as you were describing, uh, the university was a much different place than it was when you left in the late <laughs> 60s. Can you picture uh, for us on our tape here what it was like as you came to join the faculty? Well, to the best of my recollections, we had about... 40 full-time faculty members. Mm -hmm. We made a lot of use of uh, part-time men in, in law and medicine and other fields, finance, but 40 full-time members of the staff. And of course, it was just like one big family. Mm -hmm. We just had that one building and we had this uh, one room which we retired to in the middle of the morning, in the middle of the afternoon for a cup of coffee and we'd put a nickel in a cup to pay for our coffee and uh, we really had a good time. And we, we knew practically all the students by name and it was really, I've talked to other faculty members who served in those years and we all agree that those were the years when we really enjoyed our teaching the most. It was sort of like a big family, wasn't Just it? Just like a big family, yeah. yeah. And uh, we had a Christmas party every uh, year to which all the faculty members and staff were invited. I came and to those in about 1950 or so, and they were great. Yeah, and the regents, they would come. And uh, we really had a good time together. Yes. And it was wonderful. But then... With the close of the war, the influx of the bootstrappers and the men and women who weren't in the army, the school started to grow very, very rapidly. Yes. And uh, it wasn't long before we were well over the 2,000 mark, and eventually we got up past the 15,000 yes. mark. And... Uh, started getting more buildings and ruining that beautiful campus of grass and elm trees. Yeah. And of course the Dutch elm disease helped to get rid of the elm trees. Yes, that helped and to the building more helped trees. get rid of the grass. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget those sessions in the spring 
And when the dandelions started to bloom and Jack Edwards, the head of building and grounds, would have all these school kids come in with their pails and their dandelion diggers and big <laughs> dandelions all over that <laughs> acres of the campus. That was before the days of spraying for That was before the days of spraying and pre-emergence crabgrass and all that. And uh, then he would give them a big ice cream feed after they'd finished. And, uh, There's a lot of camaraderie there. The students oh, yeah, would do that, some that of the work. Oh, yeah, that was fun, too. Yeah. Now, um, thinking of the academics of the university, you came as a member of the math department, and you probably recall the sorts of programs that you had and the kinds of students. Let's dwell on that a bit. You spent so much of your life teaching mathematics here at our university, 27 years. And in that time, when you first came, what was the program like? And then how did it sort of evolve into what's been the case in more recent years? Were some of the courses the same? Were there a lot of different things? Were there, was it just basic? How was it back then? Well, uh, I would say for at least the first 10 years, maybe even 15, the courses were pretty well standardized. Mm -hmm. We had Math 113, which was a combination of algebra and trig. Was that math. for students that had never had any or had had high school math? This was for students who had had uh, uh, three semesters of high school math. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And uh, if they hadn't had three semesters of high school math, they started with introductory college algebra three times a week in the fall semester and then uh, a three, three-hour course in trig in the spring semester. And uh, the 113 and the 114 in the spring semester were five-hour courses. And uh, the spring semester is most analytic geometry. Mm -hmm. It's a preparation for calculus in their sophomore year. And during the first year I taught there full-time, in the full year, I mean, mm -hmm. I had an experience which I think had quite a, a definite influence on my teaching at the university. In the fall semester and then early in the spring semester, I knew something was going on that wasn't quite as it should be because I had about a half a dozen students. Anytime I asked them a question in class, they couldn't give me the right answer. But every time they came to a, a test, they scored a V or an A on the test which didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So I kind of kept tabs as best I could. Then when it came to the final examination in spring semester, I went down to the Steno Bureau and asked them whether I could make some changes in the final examination, just minor changes. And uh, so I'd, I took the, the uh, test copies mm -hmm. and I turned it in and I made some minor changes. So that the only thing would be if they, if they had had access to the test before I changed it, they'd have trouble. They'd get the wrong answer mm -hmm. for the test as I had changed it. And then I watched very, very carefully as they worked on their final examination. And I went around and they would put their, their textbooks and notebooks and things under their chair yes. when they took the test. And I noticed some of them picking up their uh, uh, textbooks and notebooks. And so I, I went around and these people that I suspected and picked up their textbooks and notebooks. And sure enough, I found copies of the test the way it was originally before I made the changes. Mm -hmm. And so when the first one of these students left the classroom after he'd finished his test, presumably, I went out and asked him. I said, now, uh, I found a copy of the test as it was originally in your book. You want to tell me about it? Oh, he said, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. He said, get too many people in trouble. And uh, I said, well, and I named off four or five people that I knew had been cheating in some fashion. And uh, 
He said, well, if you know about that, I might as well tell you. He said, uh, one of the students is an uh, assistant in the building and grounds and has access to keys, and he goes into Dr. Earl's office and uh, gets the master copies out of his files and uh, sells them to any students who want to buy them. Well, you got down to the bottom of it. So I really got the bottom of that, and it not only helped me, but it helped Dean Lucas, who was Dean of Students at that time, because some things had been going on Sunday afternoons in the cafeteria. Uh -huh. And it turned out that this, this boy with the keys had been taking his friends into the cafeteria for ice cream. and. So the keeper and, of the keys was the nubbin of the problem. And this also, uh, Jack Edwards had trouble believing that this boy, because he had trusted him, you know. Very? But it straightened out a lot of things, yeah. and that gave me an impetus that I think influenced my whole career at Omaha U. They knew I was going to be in for the for the honest students, and I was going to punish the dishonest students. Which is a reasonable standard that most students would be happy to accept. I think. Yeah, Harry. Uh, as we reflect on your time at the university, we can talk about buildings, we can talk about changes in buildings, but. A university, I think you'll agree with me, is made up of really the heart of it is people. Students, of course, so paramount in importance, but also faculty and administrators that are a part of our life there over the years. And what I'd like to have you do now are remember, if you would, some of the events or the people, whatever comes to mind, that made an impact on you and that you in turn feel it made a real impact on the life and times of our university. Start any place you like. First well, name that comes to mind. As I mentioned earlier, when I started teaching, we had only about 40 full-time faculty mm -hmm. members. Mm -hmm. And some of the people I recall are people like Dr. Earl and Dr. Uh, Nell Ward yes. of the chemistry department and Derbyshire in biology and... Uh, I think there was another ward who was the head of the physics at that time, wasn't there? I think that's right. I don't recall the first name. Yeah. He, he, he wasn't there for many of the years mm -hmm. that I taught there, but uh, he was one. And uh, then there was Dean uh, Thompson, of course, who was not only a graduate of the University of Omaha, but was dedicated to the University of Omaha. And uh, uh, as I think, of, and there was Paul Stageman, yes. who had been there two years already when I started, and uh, was a graduate yes. of Omaha University, had gotten his Ph.D. at the University of Iowa, at Iowa City, and uh, uh, oh, there were, there were so many of those people who had been there from the time that the university started in 24th and Pratt. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they were there because they were dedicated to teaching college students, not because of the money, which wasn't too much at that time, but because they, they felt that this was their life work. And uh, they, they really put their whole uh, intellect and strength and interest in the teaching students. You felt there was a really strong faculty, small in number but strong. I've always said that the taxpayers of Omaha got more for their tax dollar when it was the University of Omaha than since it's become the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Mm -hmm. The University of UNO has become so large and uh, has attracted so many faculty, I think, sometimes because of the money involved. Mm -hmm. Salary's mm -hmm. pretty good now. In a comparative way, they certainly are, aren't they? And, uh, and uh, I've had discussions with some people around the coffee tables when I was still teaching at OU about uh, this uh, matter of money. And I remember once that I was seated with several people, two I remember specifically, Paul Kennedy, who was at that time the uh, 
Dean of the College of Education, mm -hmm. and uh, Don Benning, who was our wrestling coach. And uh, we were talking about uh, professor's salaries and, and teaching mm -hmm. in college. And I said, well, I think that uh, sometimes higher salaries attract people because of the salary. Not because they really want to teach, but because they make good money and they have long vacations. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, I don't think this should be the, the measure of a teacher at any level of education. I think the, level, the real test should be whether they feel that they're qualified to teach and desire to teach. Really want to teach. And... Uh, I was told that uh, that was a very unprofessional attitude to take. <laughs> but you didn't change it, did you? I didn't change my <laughs> attitude, but uh, I was told that I should. In fact, I've been told more than once uh -huh. that my attitude toward and my philosophy of education was all wrong. Uh -huh. But I still think my philosophy of education is the right one for me. Fine. Now, if somebody else has a philosophy of education that works, power to them. Yeah. But I have a right to my own Indeed philosophy you do. of education. And we're glad you put it on the tape. Now, we have about five minutes left on this last in our groups of tape here, Harry, and I want to ask you a few other things. Can you think of one or two, maybe more, at least one or two major events in the life of the university that had an impact in the way of change, whatever, that you remember, that really were sizable in, in nature? Kind of a tough question. Mull it over a little if you need to. Well, that is a tough question. I remember those mill levy votes for an additional. Well, I, they didn't bother me much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I really I really haven't ever had much interest in the monetary side or the political side mm -hmm. of education. Well, with that in mind, maybe the merger, that got to be a big thing toward the end of your tenure. Did you notice anything there? Or did things go well, along pretty much the way Well, I noticed one thing, yeah. very outstanding. My department head, at the time they started talking about the merger, was uh, uh, Dr. Hunziker. Mm -hmm. I remember it. And... Uh, when they started talking about it, Dr. Hunziker told me in no uncertain terms that if the Municipal University of Omaha became a part of the University of Nebraska system, that he would be leaving because he had come to us from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. Yes. And uh, he had noted the various factional that they had down there, mm -hmm. and he didn't want to be any part of the University of Nebraska at Omaha. And he put his uh, money where his mouth was. Mm -hmm. and, he and he left and went up to that uh, university in Michigan, yeah, up in Houghton. Yes, I think that's one of the things we can remember are some changes in people. And of course, after that time, the university grew. It became a part of the state, was not just the city. Uh, but all told, the coursers and the coursework until the time you retired remained pretty much the same, didn't it? Yeah, one thing that I regretted very much, we used to have a course uh, in which a person could graduate with a degree in engineering and business administration, mm -hmm. which, in my estimation, was a wonderful course for Omaha University yeah, yeah. students. And that was... And that has been taken away yeah, yeah. from uh, UNO. And it's, I think it's down at Lincoln now. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a mistake. Yes, because of the population center here that it could need it. Yeah. Now, a couple of minutes to go. This is another tough one. You spend much of your life doing it. Why did you do it? I think you touched on your philosophy a little bit, but... Uh, what were some of the real rewards to you of teaching all these 27 years, Harry, well, and more? Well, uh, when I decided to go to college, there were three uh, professions that I was 
interested in. Uh, my mother had always wanted me to be a minister. Mm -hmm. uh, I had always admired some of the MDs that I knew. And I, and I had one of my five sisters was a graduate nurse. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought that was a wonderful profession. And I had had some wonderful teachers in high school. So I had to make the choice between the three. Well, I didn't have the money for a medical degree. I hadn't been too happy with some of the preachers we'd had in the small town. <laughs> and I had had some good teachers. Going way back to Blue Springs. Clear back to my high school days. So I decided this was something I could do successfully. Harry, and you did it so successfully for so long. And I guess speaking for the university as we record this in the summer, late spring of 1984, I want to thank you for all you contributed to our university over these many, many years in the way of strength to the department that you taught in as well as the university generally. Right. It was a pleasure having you as a friend and as a colleague, and I thank you for joining me for another of our series called Reflections in Time. Okay.